it reads like this, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind, What manner of salutation should this be? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Yes, he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, saying, I don't know a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she had also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month of her term, who was called barren. For with God nothing is impossible. Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Verse 31 says, verse 31 and verse 37 says, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, for with God all things are possible. I want to talk about being pregnant with possibility. Pregnant with possibility. Last week we discussed um, the promise of the king, the coming king. And we discussed about how the Old Testament captured and promised that Jesus was to come. Um, in our text today, we deal with the pregnancy of, of Mary. Pregnancy, it's a good thing, and it's a bad thing, depending upon how you look at it. It can be good news. For those who are trying and playing, it can be bad news. <laughs> those who weren't trying and playing, uh, it can be perfect timing. <laughs> for those who are looking for it and have set their minds on it and who have prepared for it financially, and then it can be bad timing. <laughs> for those who have not prepared themselves for the unexpected. Uh, it can be uh, the best thing that ever happened to you. And, uh, depending upon who you ask, it could also be the <laughs> worst thing that ever happened to you. Pregnancy is anything. It is possibility. It is the ability to hope for something, see something, and expect something, which is why the other term used to explain this God-given miracle to mankind is called expected. Uh, in that season where one has been impregnated with possibility, they are expecting something. They are expecting something. They're expecting someone. It's hard to lay out what's to be expected because you don't know uh, the child that is going to come forth, you don't know who it's going to look like, you don't know who it's going to act like, you don't know, you hope it don't look like so-and-so, and you hope it don't look like so-and-so, you hope they don't act like so-and-so, and you hope they do get certain traits from certain people, and then you hope they don't get certain traits from, you know, and yeah, and so-and-so, and it's, it's, it's expectancy, and, and, and I thought today that we would take this, this method that God uses to bring fruit or, or humanity into the world and apply it to all of us. I did a secret pregnancy test on the church today on everybody here, and I've got good news and bad news. The good news is all of you are pregnant. Look at how y'all looking at me. Look at how y'all looking at me. I got to tell y'all right now, the devil is alive. I mean, yeah. Anyway, but we, I wanted you to.
to understand that all of us here today, no matter how old you are, no matter how many times you said, I'm done producing, I'm done with pregnancy, I want you to understand you are pregnant. And let me be clear, to, I, this is not just a gender-related pregnancy, but even us men, <sighs> we are too, we too are pregnant with possibilities. We are pregnant. All of us in the building, the good news is we are pregnant. The question is, we don't know who the daddy is yet. <laughs> but we're going to find out when you start giving birth to the stuff you give birth to. We are spiritually pregnant with, somebody is pregnant with a business that they haven't given birth to yet. Somebody else is pregnant with a healing they haven't given, discovered yet. Somebody is pregnant with an invention. Somebody is pregnant with, pro with problems. Somebody is pregnant with promise. Somebody is pregnant with joy they ain't even discovered yet. Somebody is pregnant with a marriage they ain't even got proposed to yet. Somebody is, I want you to understand that when God impregnates you, when the Holy Spirit impregnates you, 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 you sure enough got something. But I want you to also understand that there are some other people in the building who too are also pregnant. They are pregnant with hatred, pregnant with, with, with malware, pregnant with lies, pregnant with deceit, pregnant with backbite, which is no good. Jesus, keep me near the cross. 
attention to the miracle in Mary. Uh, most times, God does a miracle amongst the people. But this time, he does a miracle in the people. It is the only miracle of its kind. It's the one-of-a-kind miracle. I want you to understand that God reserved those most sacred, uh, those unique miracles for himself. It was nothing for him to open blinded eyes and heal the sick, but when it came to raising the dead and, and giving birth through virgins, it was something that he reserved for only what he was doing for his son. In order for Jesus to get here, there were so many other ways he could have came. He could have just showed up out of nowhere as a grown man, and nobody knew who he was, and, and, and he could have just and he could have just wiped everybody's memory. He could have just appeared out of thin air. But he chose the birth canal so that he could identify with the way we were born. He wanted us to understand how if you can survive the womb, you can make it to the tomb. He wants you to understand that if you can survive in the tight place, you can survive in the world's place. I want you to understand, he decided to preserve this miracle for nobody but him. Nobody else has ever been born through the loins of a virgin. He could have just came out of nowhere. It seems as though God chose Mary's womb to be his dressing room. Yeah. Oh, so that he could change clothes. Because you do know that him coming through the Virgin Mary uh, was not just his first arrival. Jesus has been here the whole time. But he was just God among us. But now he had to become God with us. And I need you to understand that, that he chose Mary's womb to be his dressing room so that he could change from deity to humanity. It is in this untouched womb that, that man's best God becomes God's best man. The Bible does not clarify or capture much of Jesus' toddler years. We don't find scriptures that support his first steps or his first words or uh, him slipping and falling on the coffee tables of his father's house. He, 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 we don't capture those moments where he had to get his bottom tapped because he'd been misbehaving. He, we don't capture those toddler years and those elementary years of Christ. We got the birth and the, and the baby and then we go straight into teenage years. The gospel writers do not capture those childhood moments of him, and I want you to understand that there is revelation in the absence of information. I want you to understand that he wants us to see that when he gets here, that we, he wants us to see him, even though he is a baby, he is still a king, and there's nothing childish about king. Oh, this reminds me that if you are going to be a king, you must put away childish things. So Luke being a physician, of all the gospel writers that capture the miracle in Mary's womb, Luke is the one I chose because him being a physician it captures the most descriptive perspective. Luke being a doctor, he knows that uh, you ain't supposed to be pregnant unless you've been intimate. He knows how to capture all the details. When you understand uh, the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke is the most descriptive because he is a doctor. Matthew is a tax collector, so he is actually going to be the most economical in his approach, in his writings. John was more sensitive. Mark wrote from a, from a perspective of a teenage boy that was not a disciple. John was a more passionate writer. He captured the love of God. But Luke, he captures this, this gospel in a way that it appeals to the eye of the skeptic. He makes sense of those things that don't make sense. And so in this text we find of uh, Luke captures the miracle in Mary's womb, and he teaches us how Mary became pregnant with possibility. And I thought today that we would explore this text and look at the look at the mechanics of the miracle. And the first thing I see is the call that happened. If you look at verse 26 through 29, and I'm not going to read all of that for you, but if you look at verse 26, look at verse 26. I want you to see something here. Verse 26 says, and in the sixth month. We're going to come back to that. The angel Gabriel was sent from God. Now, unto a city, Galilee, and Nazareth. Now, you must understand, 
that this, of all the angels of God, he says Gabriel. Now, you must understand angels are nothing more than God's thoughts made real. Angels are what God uses to accomplish his task. They are errand boys. They are errand runners. They don't know any, they know nothing of salvation. They know nothing about what it means to be redeemed. They already belong to him. They are nothing more than spirits sent out to do a task. The angel Gabriel is, it, he is uh, what we call the angel of annunciation. He's basically God's announcement clerk. He is uh, God's fed medium. He is God's, uh, he's the one, the angel that God uses to make announcements. Gabriel shows up first in Daniel chapter 8, verse 16, when he actually gives Daniel the explanation concerning his vision. Uh, the vision and the dream that he had. Uh, Gabriel is that angel that explains things and proclaims things. Gabriel is God's angel of annunciation. God sends Gabriel to announce to Mary and have a call, a conversation with her. And at the time he finds her, she's engaged to Joseph. She's getting ready to be married. She's found her dream guy. And uh, they are preparing for uh, their wedding. She's a young girl. She has never been touched. She's never been intimate with anybody else. She's got a husband in waiting. She's engaged to be married to him. In verse 27, it tells us that he's of the house of David. This is significant because God promised that his miracle son would be coming through the lineage of David. As a matter of fact, that lineage even goes back to Abraham. Because the seed, the Bible tells us that the seed of Abraham would be blessed. It would bless. He told Abraham one day, he said, look up, count the stars. Abraham said, I can't. He said, that's how many ways and how many people are going to be blessed through your seed. I want you to understand that Jesus came through the lineage of Abraham through 42 generations. That's why he said, Joseph of David's house. He wanted every devil in hell to know that what I promised in the Old Testament about to happen in the New Testament. Just like he promised it in Matthew chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, it gives us the lineage of Jesus, the 42 generations that Jesus had to come through just to get to her womb. Now, I want you to understand, Joseph is now put into a very tricky position that was not popular then. Joseph is now stepped in. Um, wait a minute, Pastor. Hold up. Just lost him, Pastor. Yeah, Joseph is engaged to his wife to be. And already, he got to be stepdad. And this ain't just anybody's baby. It's the Holy Ghost baby. Uh, and the angel tells him, he says, look, Mary, I know you engaged. And now you're pregnant by the Holy Ghost. But you found favor. Favor. Does, is there anybody but me that don't see that as favor? How is it that I'm favored, but my house is disrupted? Has God ever favored you and you were like, God, don't do me no more favor. <laughs> if this is favor, I don't want it. Lord told me, I called you to preach. I said, man, you sure you don't do nothing else with me? I play drums. I ain't got no problem with that. <laughs> then the Lord pulled up your door and said, I called you to pass us some knives. I ain't going to be able to do that. <laughs> Everybody else looked at, oh, my God, that's favor. And I'm like, no, nah, you don't understand. I've been around pastors long enough to know that ain't favor. God may call it favor, but it ain't always favorable. I don't get a private life. I got to pull knives out of my back with fingerprints of people I love on it. You don't understand. That ain't favor. And I want you to understand that Mary is in a position where she's been favored by God, but it don't feel good. Her favor is now frustrating. Our Catholic brothers and sisters, some of them want you to believe that Mary is a one, one to be worshipped. But she is not to be worshipped. The text says in verse 28 that she is faithful.
favor, she is blessed among women, not blessed above women. See, just because God does a miracle through you does not make you one to be worshipped. And we think because God used us that we better than everybody else. I never told you I was better than the next man. I'm just the one God chose. And if you got a problem with whether you want to be, don't take it up with the one that you gave to. But our Catholics, uh, brothers and sisters, they do believe in Jesus. They believe in salvation. But they believe that Mary should be high and lifted up. And that is not the case. Mary is a woman just like everybody else. The Bible says she was, she was one among the women, not above women. So that's the call, and then we look at the conversation. Look at the conversation in verse 30. Somebody say conversation. conversation. So he calls her and tells her, this is the calling on your life. And Mary said, wait a minute, we need to talk. <laughs> and so, uh, and the angel said unto her, because she, she left off, she said, what kind of, what, I wonder what he's talking about. And, and the text says in verse 30, the angel said unto her, fear not. Don't worry about it, don't be scared. You found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. The she finds favor. That word favor means to make, be made accepted. It, favor ain't fair. But it ain't free. Uh, that's why you got to be careful on looking down on folks and talking about folks that got more than you got. Because you don't know what it took to get what they got. It amazes me how folks can, you know, they look at your house, and look at what you drive, and look at your marriage, and they think, ooh, I want that. They don't even know what all the hell you had to go through. They look at y'all been married 30 plus years, and they don't know y'all spent two years apart. You couldn't stand each other for the first five, and you, you don't know. They can look at your house, and they think, because you got all this stuff, they don't know you been had to work three or four jobs, and, and eat sandwiches and with no meat on it for lunch and dinner sometimes. You can, you can look, well, look at how y'all look at me. You ain't always been where you are, but thanks be to God that he'll train you. That's why you can't look down. Don't judge my breakthrough until you understand my pain. Because that 2,000 years later, that name gonna mean something. Yeah. 
go back. I ain't gonna worry about it. Just call Jesus. He makes all things new. Jesus, my rock. Jesus, my redeemer. I'm just a big move, though, right? Chose not to give birth to my Savior. And I'm not 
saying that would have been the end. But I'm saying it would have been a bad thing. The devil had replaced our good pride with a black pride. Let that sink in. See, Satan does not have the power to create. He only has the ability to contaminate by imitation. Can I say that again? Follow me now. He does contamination by way of imitation. Because he can't create anything on his own. So what he does is contaminate what God already created. We call it a good Friday. So he said, well, I'm going to come out with a black Friday. Fool, that's why they call it Black Friday. Don't you not understand? He said, if I can get them to devote the whole holiday season to spending on what's trendy. I'll get them to forget about the gift that keeps on giving. Which leads me to ask, 
if you're married to God, are you cheating on him with the devil? Are you giving birth to kids that ain't got nothing to do with God? Because the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long suffering. You don't need to keep going. But you keep giving birth to hate and chaos and mad. And you always quit. Something wrong with you. We don't got to do a spiritual DNA test. You, you've been sleeping with the enemy. And here's the problem. Church folk got the audacity to pray the devil away and play with the devil every day. Oh, that's the conception. That's the conception. Because if you want the devil to flee, stop courting him. That's why he ain't gone. Because you keep him fighting him back. Look, that last thing is confirmation. 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 Verse 36 and 38. That's all done with this. Uh, so we, we, we dealt with the call. We dealt with the conversation. We dealt with the conception. And the last thing is the confirmation. Verse 36 and 38. The text says, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she had also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called down. Now, I told you earlier that I was going to come back to that verse 26. If we're not careful, we'll read verse 26 as though God is talking about the sixth month of the year. But that is not what Luke is talking about. He's talking about the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Why is this relevant? Because this is the confirmation. I want you to understand. Because you are the sum total of the people you hang around. If you want to be great, you can't hang around stupidity. Ooh, Bible later tells us about how when they got together, they had their own baby shower. And when they got there, John, who she's pregnant with, John the Baptist, he couldn't wait till he got up the moon and he started dancing in the room. He's going to give God a shout. Because, her, because the baby in her connected with the baby in her. Now, I want you to understand that. Uh, I want you to understand that when you got people that pregnant with you, you just start rejoicing with you. And look at this, look at this, look at this. Don't miss this. This was confirmation of what God could do. She was barren, but God. And Mary concludes everything. I love the way she concluded it. After she understood everything in verse 38, she says, Lord, I'm your maid. I'm your maid, sir. The word virgin is not a mere definition of a woman who has never been sexually active. But it also translates to the word maid servant. It translates in the Hebrew and the Greek back to the word maid servant. M-A-D-E, not M-A-I-D. Now, if we're not careful, we will assume that just because verse 38, uh, Mary calls herself the handmaid, M-A-I-D, which is a servant, a cleaner, uh, one that looks after, a caretaker. But the English had no way, no word to describe the Greek word uh, that they used to describe maid servant. So they chose the word handmaid. But I want you to understand, because there are no synonyms, no antonyms uh, in the Hebrew and Greek language. What I want you to understand is this, is that she was made a servant, and now she be chose to be a maid servant. Does that make sense? She was made to be a servant. Now she became a maid servant. So they, they connected her calling into one word, handmaid, because she was handmade by God. Now she is a handmaid to God. She was a handmaid by God to be handmaid to God. Does that make sense? Why this is important? She now accepts her role. She says, Lord, that 
therefore, I am your maidservant. And guess what? Then the angel left. I want you to understand God is not leaving until you say yes. Lord, why you gonna leave me alone? Why you gotta keep taking me through this because you ain't saying yes? And this whole text, although Jesus is the star, it does not move until she said yes. Do you agree to the terms and conditions? She said yes. And I'm so glad she did. Because had she not, we don't know where we would be. All I wanted you to understand today is that you are pregnant with possibilities. I don't know what you're pregnant with, but if it is of God, carry your baby to term. There will be danger in the delivery room. But carry your baby to turn. And if God got to cut it out of you, he'll bring it out. But if you're pregnant with demonic fruit, understand two things. Pastor Jay is coming for you. Second, when I find you, I'm going to heal you. And I'm going to send that fruit back to the pits of hell. We ain't going to abort it. I'm just going to send it back. And then I'm going to make sure you get connected with the Holy Spirit. So you can give birth to better fruit. I don't throw people away. I fix them. And then once we fix them, God can give them. You are pregnant with possibilities. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you so much. Lord, we have been used by everybody. We haven't done what we should have done. We haven't done everything in the way we should have done it. And Lord, we have failed you so many times. We weren't even virgins when you used us. <laughs> but we thank you that you made us new. That you used us anyway. Lord, prepare us to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy. Tried and true. With thanksgiving, we'll be a willing sanctuary for you. Yes. 